Octagon touches down in Jacksonville, Florida on Saturday, featuring a pair of title bouts. Headlining the card is defending featherweight champion Alexander Volkanovsky, who will be putting his belt on the line against the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung. And if you know anything about TKZ's career, he will come forward and force the action. Whether that's a good idea against someone as technically sound as Volkanovsky remains to be seen. In the co-main event, there's a bitter Bantamweight title rematch between Aljamain Sterling and Piotr Jan. Last March, when they first matched up for the strap, it sure looked like Jan was headed towards a relatively convincing win until he threw an illegal knee in round four. Sterling was unable to continue, and by rule, he was crowned the new champion. Sterling is keenly aware that to be recognized by the fans as a true champion, he needs to make a statement Saturday night. But as Jan's opponents have learned, that is something that is easier said than done. And another fight to look forward to is Hamza Chemaev taking a big step up in competition against Gilbert Burns. Chemaev's first four fights in the UFC have been historic, and the welterweight has outstruck his opponents 112 to 1 in significant strikes and looks to be a runaway train toward a future title showdown against current king Kamaru Usman. But Burns, despite being a huge underdog, is ready for the challenge. I like that confidence that he has. Beat this guy and get a finish, battle shot. Many questions will be answered Saturday night in what is shaping up to be one of the best cards of the year. But who will leave the octagon with gold? We're gonna find out at UFC 273. Let's welcome in one half of the Morning Combat podcast. We get Luke Thomas with us today on this Friday, getting us ready for UFC 273. Let's start with the main event, Alexander Volkanovsky versus the Korean Zombie. Uh, Volkanovsky working to defend that featherweight belt. He has now won 20 in a row. He is minus 700, Luke, to win this. You think it's a little high, but how one-sided does this fight have the potential to be? Well, I definitely think Volkanovski is going to win. So the odds makers certainly are, I, I, I believe, picking the right outcome in terms of who they favor. Still, the 700 part it always makes me a little bit nervous. That's when they're really looking past a guy. And you have to understand why that might be. Well, part of it is defensible, which is to say Volkanovski is unlike really any other fighter in the UFC. I don't know anyone who has a strategy and a game that he implements that looks as unique as his. And what do I mean by that? He does something called scramble people's brains. That's what, how he puts it. <laughs> and the reason why he says that is he doesn't mean he punches hard. Of course, he can do that, too. But what he does is he tries to make you overload with decisions. The human mind can only make a certain amount of computations in a narrow window, five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever it is. He overloads you so you can't keep up. And then once you think you've got it, he changes the patterns behind all the looks and the camouflage and the tricks and the feints and everything else that he does. So people can never tell if he's coming or going. Is it takedown or punch? Is it high or is it low? Is it left or is it right? And they just sit there. And actually you see that there's a suppressive effect. They're all of his opponent's offense typically goes down numerically in terms of the overall stats after a fight is over because they get caught looking. They don't know what's coming at them. Nobody seems to have an answer for that. Max Holloway got kind of close two times, but even then couldn't do it. And Korean Zombie, he is very good on the ground, and he is, I would say, of the two, the much harder puncher. And so because there's four-ounce gloves and he's a good counterboxer, that, that's the reason why I think the minus 700 is a little high. But asking me to pick someone or which direction I lean, it's just hard to uh, look at anyone in that featherweight division not named Max Holloway to think that Volkanovski has, you know, a worthy adversary, yes, in Korean Zombie, but a real threat to his title. It would take a cataclysmic error, I think, for Volkanovski to be uh, have the title taken from him on Saturday. But that error can happen sometimes. Let's go to the fight before that. We get Aljamain Sterling versus Piotr Jan. Uh, we've got to wait 13 months for this rematch. The last time it ended in a disqualification for Jan because of an illegal knee. Things already got chippy between these two yesterday. Jan is the favorite. Uh, tell me how you think this unfolds and how we look at the last fight going into this one. Yeah, so the last fight, let's start there, was really interesting. By everyone's estimation, Sterling won the first round, and he was, with his offense, raining on Peter Jan. That guy was looking for an umbrella, and there wasn't one to find. The only issue is two problems with it. One, he was scoring, and don't get me wrong, he won that first round cleanly, even though, by the way, Sterling got dropped in the first round and still won it by just how much volume was there. 
But the two problems were, one, it wasn't scalable offense. It was good for a round or maybe two, but he couldn't keep it up after that. In the first round, Peter Yan only scored 10 significant strikes. In rounds three and four, he had 30 and I think 34 respectively. He turned it up big time. So that was one. The other problem was he was touching Peter Yan, but he wasn't hurting him. He wasn't deterring him. I really think that's a big component. Number two, I would also say, or even three, that Sterling had 17 attempted takedowns in the first fight. He only got one of them. By contrast, Jan got seven of seven. Sterling is a, a very good striker, but he's a very elite grappler. He has got to get that number a little bit higher. So looking forward, what can be done here? Sterling's got an uphill climb. Now, Jan is a slow starter, and Sterling is a hot starter. So I think if he wins that first round, okay, it's we got a ball game. But number one, if he doesn't, that's a big problem. If he, if he can't win the first round, I don't know how Sterling wins the bout. And more to the point, pay attention to Jan. Jan lets the fight come to him, so he kind of, I'm not going to say gives away the first round, but it's not the one he's really trying to win. He tries to win about from the second or halfway through the second there on. That's when he makes all, the, all those adjustments. And that's when you saw that in the first fight, in the third and fourth round, he was dealing to still Sterling. Sterling has got to find a way to not merely start strong again, scale that offense out so you have it for two or three rounds. You've got to start that adjustment process from a guy who can make so many different modular adjustments to his game. you got to push that further back to Jan. And going back to that, the takedowns have got to be there, and the damage on the strikes have got to be there. Jan himself, by the way, a devastating puncher. He has the most knockdowns of any bantamweight in UFC history. So as I mentioned, Sterling, capable, but this is an uphill climb for a guy in Jan who can just take the pieces of your game away like a Jenga puzzle over time until it implodes. Two title fights, but it is the one. Uh, this might be the one that people are talking the most about, the welterweight mm. clash between Gilbert Burns and Hamza Chemaev. Uh, Luke, you guys were able to talk to Gilbert Burns. We're going to set up the fight here in a minute, but here's part of that interview. On April 9th, one of the most important fights in the welterweight division that you could make with or without a title, it will take place. UFC 273, Jacksonville, Florida, and it will involve Hamza Chemaev versus Gilbert Dorino Burns. Let's talk about this fight, Hamza Chemaev. We'll start there. A lot of people wondering why you took it, because you seem to be much further along in your career, much higher up in the division. Granted, he's got a ton of hype from what's going on, but he's never really even faced anyone like you, much less beat you. Why'd you take it? The way I see it, we both want to fight. For sure, he's a little bit behind, but we kind of asking to get an opponent. No one, no one shows up. I'm putting my hands up. The guy's putting his hands up over there. I fight you. Let you know. Let's do it. I text Ali and say, I want to fight this guy. I think he's a very good fighter. For sure, the guy has power on his hands and he can grapple. I don't think he's the high level he's grappling. Do you think a win over Jamaev gets you directly back in the title picture? I would like to say yes, but maybe. A title shot can never be promised. You gotta earn. So me going there against this guy, like you said, is a little gamble, but I like the risk and I like the rewards. How much does the loss to the champ though still eat at you considering you had him hurt, you had him on the ropes in the first round, how much does that still just grind the gears every morning, every night? To be honest, I'm over that already. Uh, it was a great experience. I don't have nothing against Kamara. He was just here today. He helped me out. Did he really? Yeah. So glad to hear that. He helped me out a couple rounds, and we have a good relationship. It's nothing personal. It's nothing against him. I want to become a champion. If he's holding the belt, yeah, we're going to do a great match. Gilbert Burns going after that prize. Yes, he is. Daring to be great. So you get Gilbert Burns, a seasoned vet. Chemaev, uh, he went pro 2018. This will be his fifth UFC fight. He is still undefeated. I mean, he just kind of burst onto the scene from nowhere. Get us ready for this fight. I've only seen something like this a handful of times in my years covering MMA, about 15 or so. I've seen this maybe less than four times. This is a historic matchup, and I use that word intentionally and without any – I'm not – I want this is no hyperbole. This is a historic matchup in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Very rarely do you see someone get a fight where they have, uh, to your words, burst onto the scene with, I mean, he has bulldozed through everything. There hasn't been a lot of it, but what there's been, he has absorbed through four fights, one, one significant strike. His power carries up a weight class. You just see the highlight there when he knocked out Gerald Mearshart at uh, 185 pounds in 17 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be very clear. The sample size is small. 
but there has never been a fighter like this. Even John Jones, when he came through, he burst on the scene as well. It was a bit of a slower uh, graduation. It was Andre Guzmao, then Stefan Bonner, then Jake O'Brien, then Matt Yushchenko, then Vera. And it was a while before he got to you know, the, the Bader or Shogun Hua. But even then, every time he went out there, you were like, how is this guy who's so new to the game just blowing away these vets? Sometimes these guys are shot out of a cannon. They're just different. And and Chemayev seems to be certainly that way. He has a background in freestyle wrestling. He has phenomenal ground and pound. Again, his power goes up a weight class. But here's the deal. Gilbert Burns, while he is smaller than uh, Chemayev, at least historically speaking, he's fought at 155. This fight will be at 170 pounds. We are talking about a multiple-time world champion in the gi, which is basically the most prestigious kind you can get. He did it more than once, then gets over to MMA. He's a phenomenal jiu-jitsu player, obviously. He can wrestle and scramble. He has good striking. We indicated he'd already rocked the champion in his bout with him. Here you see him with that left hook dropping Demi and Maya. This dude can do everything, and he can do it at a high level and has more than double the MMA experience of Hamza Chemaev. And yet, here is the rub, ladies and gentlemen. Chemaev is not just favored to win. He is favored to blow him out of the water. There are a couple of times in MMA history I can point to to help your audience understand this, where a guy gets to about 9, 10, 11 fights, and they're just jumped to the front of the line, either by circumstance or whatever. George St. Pierre, in 2005, when he fought uh, Frank Trigg, Frank Trigg was expected to be this dude who, you know, no one had, people had beaten him, but not soundly. And then GSP mowed him over and became GSP at that point, basically. Or you could look at Daniel Cormier, his 10th pro fight. He beat Josh Barnett to win the Strike Force Heavyweight Grand Prix in May of 2012, right? All of a sudden, what did they do? They beat a guy who was so legitimate that there was no other conclusion to draw than they were championship material. That's it. And I'm telling you right now, if Chemayev beats Gilbert Burns, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not advocating for Leon Edwards to lose his title shot, but the only thing that would make sense after this would be to fight Kamara Usman. Everything else would be a waste of time. Gr Gilbert Burns is the real deal Holyfield, and if Chemayev can beat him in his 11th pro fight, that dude is going to be trouble for a lot of people for a long time. Knock, knock, MFers, because here comes Hamzat Chemayev. And seven out of his ten fights uh, have all ended in the... Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis. No yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.